Hello to everyone again. Uh, this is the latest in a series of short video webcasts that uh, the Vermeer team have been putting together. Just as a quick reminder, the Vermeer Global Fund is managed by Charlie Fricker, who's here with me today, James Rousel, Aaron Patel and myself. Um, we run a 30 to 60 long only global equities portfolio that pretty much invests everywhere. Last week, we went to our first in-person conference in a very long time, actually, post the COVID era, which was quite uh, a change and very welcome indeed. And uh, Charlie, what did you make of uh, what we heard last week and how nice it was to be back actually seeing companies in person and talking to them live? I know it was, it was great. It felt a bit weird, actually. Um, it seemed like what the world was like a long, long time ago. I think it's been about three years, nearly, since we've been to an in-person conference, mostly just sitting in chairs talking to companies over Zoom, which... I mean, from my point of view, being back in person, seeing people face to face was was so much better. I think you get far more out of company meetings, seeing them in the flesh than you do over a, over a phone call or over Zoom. Um, but yeah, no, it was great. We managed to see, I think about, it was about 20 companies, I think over the course of three days between the team yeah. um, from all sorts of different industries, uh, all, all, you know, UK listed businesses mostly. So it was, it was really, really good to go out and see people again. Um, and also get the chance to catch up with uh, with some of our portfolio holdings. And I know we had a we had a, an update meeting from uh, from our current biggest portfolio position uh, in BP um, towards the end of the conference, didn't we? Absolutely. And uh, you know, obviously, it was a really opportune time to catch up with them, given that all that's been going on with them having to sort of write down their Russian exposure pretty much to zero, hold that asset for sale, effectively strip out whatever dividends come from that asset going forward and obviously that's you know led to an adjustment in the company's cash flows but i thought overall you know the, the update we had from them was still pretty reassuring the obviously the higher oil price is certainly hope, helping with cash flows but you know from our perspective you know what's really important for bp is that the development of their convenience and mobility business the charging business is all still going very strongly. We feel that the convenience part of the business is really an undervalued asset by markets, but that overall, despite that setback, and which has obviously created a little bit of share price pressure relative to other things that are done better in the oil sector, the message with respect to cash flows, balance sheet debt, further disposals, the ability of the company to pay its dividend buyback shares and keep uh, going straight ahead with its further investment in charging, in convenience and mobility of the Castrol brand and obviously its renewable energy strategy was all pretty um, was all pretty encouraging and reassuring despite the obvious setback that they've seen. Uh, I mean, apart from BP, Charlie, I thought one of the interesting things, we saw a lot of consumer brand type businesses and, you know, the messaging from them, you know, was really very interesting at, you know, this very, very different time given we're just emerging from COVID, but also facing these very severe inflation headwinds now. Yeah, I think that was the, that was the general theme amongst most of the companies that we saw, you know, the cost issues in inflation supply chain problems were all front and center. But generally, I think a lot of the businesses we saw from the kind of top line revenue perspective and the demand perspective, they were all still pretty, pretty encouraged. So I think, you know, overall, the updates were reassuring from, from most of the businesses uh, we saw, especially the ones we own. I mean, we had the opportunity to see, um, to see Cranswick, um, the UK kind of food producer, which uh, has had another really reassuring really update just after the close of their, um, they entered quiet periods, there was limited stuff that they could say. But over the overall story and the trends that, that, we're, that they're seeing and the reasons we invest in the company in the first place are all, are all still true. Um, you know, they're the type of business we like to find that, in, you know, their priority number one is investing back in the business for the long term. And I think they're, you know, they highlighted the service levels they've managed to produce over the COVID period, how they've managed to serve their clients. And I think as they look to expand from pork further into poultry, it sets them up really well for the long term to take share off clients who they described as underinvested and over leveraged, um, which puts them in a really strong business position to pick up business. And we think this, the shares haven't really reflected the, um, the positive uh, performance nature of the company, despite all the difficulties that they've had. Um, and I, I think you can kind of say the similar about um, Ocado in a way. Again, the up, it was one of the most reassuring updates I think we've had with the business for a very long time. Um, yes, the, the stock's performed poorly. It's been difficult. It's been seen as a COVID winner. But I think over the last 18 months, 
the business is now in a much stronger place. They've placed a lot of emphasis on these new products and software launches that they announced earlier this year that should come into effect towards the end of this year, which should halve the time it takes to launch a new fulfillment center. And I think, you know, we've, we've discussed this before, haven't we, that it's been seen as almost a COVID beneficiary and a de- COVID's been a detractor for their business. They Absolutely. talk about, you know, needing to get new people in to see the facilities live and then they go, wow, I've got to have some of this. Um, and then they get the contracts uh, as a result. And I think they're going to spend a lot of time focusing on talking to client, new clients about what Kroger has seen and their big kind of key partner in the US that has performed exceptionally well on the back of Ocado technology. Um, and the litigation overhang is what it is, um, but they still remain in a, they're in a pretty pretty confident position around that. Um, and again, in the UK, consumer, another position in the fund, uh, Pets at Home, uh, they, they continue to seem to prove to the market that we are not yet at peak ped, um, despite the fact that everyone seems to think we are. But I think, you know, the amount of uh, guidance increases we've seen from the business over the last kind of 12 to 18 months has proven that they continue to execute really well. And the one thing that they tried to emphasize is that during the last, you know, as we enter into this more difficult period for the consumer and inflation, what that's going to do to household spending. During the last recession, the last thing that they saw consumers cut back spending on was their pet. Um, and with over, I think, about three and a half million new pets in the population over the last kind of two years, um, they're in a position to continue to pick up business and continue to win share and gain more of that kind of lifetime value of the pet on both the spending and in the veterinary business, which continues to perform well and use their strong balance sheet to expand into new areas such as dog walking, doggy daycare, um, things like that. Um, and I think, you know, amongst the other businesses we saw, you had, you know, meetings with Fever Tree, Delata, Lounges, so lots of other businesses in different spaces. But one thing that I remember we did, we discussed this during one of the, the breaks between meetings that a lot of these companies that we've seen are in fundamentally much stronger positions now as a business than they were three, five years ago. But yet when we look at the share price performance, it really hasn't been kind of reflected in, in, in the performance of, uh, of the shares of a lot of these companies, has it? I think that is absolutely right. I mean, I, I thought that the meeting that we had with Cranswick was particularly noteworthy for that. And by the way, you know, with respect to pets, I can certainly confirm that Stan, the diabetic cat, continues to have uh, an enormous amount of money spent on him um, irrespective of the poor chap's health but uh, and I know you've got a similar situation with a dog in your family who's got diabetes and that uh, the, the bills continue to rack up for that so <laughs> we're certainly not a big pets in our houses Charlie that's for sure so um, but the, you know the Cranswick thing was really interesting because you know when we first saw Cranswick three years ago at the similar conference you know at Grove you know the business then had been really successful in building up a fantastic franchise in the pork industry in the UK. And it's done a similar thing as it said it would do with the development of a whole new plant in I, and which is probably gonna further expand another significant cost uh, and further develop profitability from there. It's done it all from its own cash flows. It's not borrowed any more money. It's continued to pay down debt as it's raised, you know, raised that rate, raised that factory and really grown a second string to, to its business. And yet the shares are pretty much where they were soon after we first saw them. And that seems to me, you know, quite a common theme amongst a number of really good UK businesses. It's one of the reasons actually that we like UK equity strategy. So obviously we run a global fund, but in the context of that, you know, we've got BP and Cranswick Pets Home, as you mentioned, because we do see some very attractive valuations for some really, really well managed businesses that just have not had the appropriate reward in terms of their share price for the businesses that they that they have created from their own internally generated cash flows, which I think, you know, is a tremendous thing and actually over time should still come to the fore. So anyway, that's uh, our video for today. Thank you for your time, Charlie, and the update on all the companies that you saw. Hope everyone is well. And uh, for more information, don't hesitate to visit the Vermeer.London website. Uh, and uh, we'll leave it there. And thank you very much indeed for your time today.